So that's the first of four parts in this video, just general economic landscape of what the freehold is. And last and most important is the wealthiest province, Sothorios. The, the rest of this video is going to be talking about that in depth. The, I asked about this. Both Dragon Lord factions, the Sphinxes and the Young Dragons, are based in the city of Valyria. At least when the story begins, possibly throughout. And at first I wondered if the Young Dragons' headquarters is in the provinces or something, because they, you know, they conquered the provinces at first. And I was directly told, no, that they're like Rome, where both the Optimates and Populares were based in the city of Rome to convene in the Senate. Like, you could be a powerful Roman senator from, uh, who's a new man from the conquest, and you own a lot of land in conquered Spain, but you live in Rome. Plus, you know, they need to be in Valyria so their dragons can nest in the Fourteen Flames. So we'll, we'll see this, I don't know. I think the Sphinxes would physically own more land in the Valyrian Peninsula, and the young dragons would, like, own more land in Slaver's Bay, in the conquered regions, but that's where their plantations are. That They live, their, their families, aristocratic families, live in the capital city. The freeholder's strongest power base is the Valyrian province in Sothorios, and a lot of comparisons to its Roman North Africa. It's like Constantinople or Carthage. And some people have noted this in the comments, by the way, that a couple of months ago I made this short video Q&A with George R. R. Martin about world maps in the Game of Thrones prequel TV series. That, oh, this was around May of 2017. I point out via Martin's blog that, you know, it's weird for the sake of the prequel shows that the world maps they show in Game of Thrones merchandise and on the screen leave off Sothorios, and they leave off Yeeti, and you can kind of see, well, okay, they leave off Yeeti, it's really far to the east, they wouldn't go there, but Sothorios should be within the, the four sides of the map, and they just show it as ocean, rather, oh, it's too complicated, we're, we're simplifying it so people understand it, and it's, you're leaving Africa off the maps, and making it look like there's only white people, countries in this show which is weird. It's like I said, it's like leaving Wakanda off a map of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I said, will the successor shows just, you know, update the Essos map eventually, update the world map to show this is where Sothorios is? And his words to me were, I would vote for that, certainly. And he was playing coy with me that I was told they started work on Empire of Ash in around 2016. They've been working on it for two years and I asked this of Martin one year ago, that he knew they were making a prequel with Sothorios as a major location. And just, he was playing Cory with me. He got me there. So, some have already guessed this, because it's obvious from a map, that the headquarters of the Freeholders faction is specifically the regional capital of the Valyrian province in Sothorios, a major port city, Zamatar. I didn't say that in the original leak, but I thought it was obvious. Here's a map view. Um, I hope you can see it at, at this resolution on YouTube. I tried playing around with this. If not, there's maps online, but I'm doing the best I can here. Let me zoom in on it. It's at the River Delta. Now, Zamatar, the regional capital of the province in Sothorios, they stated that it's the wealthiest city in the entire Valyrian freehold after Old Valyria itself. It's more important than Volantis. So because it's the biggest and wealthiest colony, logically it became the main hub of the freeholders as a faction. Their headquarters and stronghold. So that's why, well, they have to meet somewhere. They're not just fighting all over the freehold. There are certain provinces where they, they could rise in a rebellion because they're far enough away from Valyria and have enough of a power base. So, logically, they have to have a meeting place. The meeting place and headquarters would be in the wealthiest province. question is, well, why would Sothorios be the wealthiest province? So, and our conversation, again, that they directed me to things by asking Socratic questions, so I would agree with it even as a book fan of just, oh, we're making this up, of... Well, if you as a book reader had to guess, what would sound most sensible to you? And that, yeah, that's actually what they did. 
so, you know, I'm asking, okay, it would be in one of the more uh, powerful provinces. I assume I went, oh, so is there headquarters in Volantis or Marine that I assume that it would be somewhere that a TV audience would be familiar with because we've seen those already. And they just smiled at me and went, South Oreos. And I went, oh, cool. You mean in Gogosos? And they go, no, Zamatar. And I was standing in front of my wall-mounted Lands of Ice and Fire maps. So I'm pointing at these. And I'll explain why. I was startled. Zamatar? I was startled that mainland South Oreos is the wealthiest, most powerful colony, more than Volantis. But then, and they explained it so elegantly that within 10 minutes, I was, of course. It's just, how, I went from going, how can Zamatar be the most powerful? Then they just said, Zamatar controls the shipping lanes coming back from Yeti. The direct comparison they then stated was, it's like a cross between Roman Carthage and Constantinople. It dominates all the trade routes coming back from the Far East. You know, I kept saying before that, oh, it's like Constantinople. It's an, it's a melting pot of different peoples. Why is it a melting pot? Because people come in on trade routes. That it's right along the major uh, route that people need to take. So if you haven't heard of Yi Ti before, Yi Ti is their world's version of Imperial China. It's, it's where you find ethnically East Asian people. When people go, oh, you don't have a lot of East Asian people in this. Well, it is like medieval England in Westeros. They go, you know, there are Asian people in this world. They're in Yi Ti. They are the oldest continuous civilization in the world since the Long Night itself, 8,000 years ago. They are older than the Valyrians. The Valyrians only started conquering and expanding some 5,000 years ago. And, you know, in contrast to that, you know, the Valyrians were destroyed. The E.T. is still going strong. That they have a continuous 8,000-year history. That everything is, you know, times 10 in this in the book series. Everything is bigger and larger than life. That if you think about how medieval Europeans looked at, wow, look at what a vast history China has. They never had a Dark Ages. They had civil wars now and again, but nothing that destroyed their written culture and it dialed their civilization back to zero. That When you have a society that's that old and you get really refined courtly manners and rules of behavior and cultural courtly sophistication, they are the most sophisticated culture in the world, the China or Yi Qi, that they mention that the royal palace in their capital city is the size of King's Landing. And the only reason they're not the most powerful world-conquering empire ever is they didn't have dragons and the Valyrians did, but they're older and a lot more advanced. And they, probably one of the reasons why the Valyrians couldn't easily conquer them, not just that they're far away, but they're strong and strong in magic as well, that this is a great civilization, which is the hero of its own story off to the east, that they barely hear of in Westeros. Economically, why is it important to be on the shipping lanes coming back from E.T.? E.T. is the main source of silk in the world. That They don't make silk in Westeros or the Free Cities or Valyria. Silk is imported from the exotic lands of the East, and ultimately all of it from E.T. On top of that, it's not just silk. Also, they are very rich in exotic spices. Uh, the major spices are black peppercorn, cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, and saffron. Now, I say this because there might be, like, a cartel for nutmeg or something. They, when they're making up freeholders that dominate different industries, that might be one of them. And I looked this up, that these were the top five spices uh, in, traded in real life from China by the Dutch East India Company. And then in Fire and Blood, which came out just two weeks ago... There's a point where King Jahera says, well, we need to start making luxury taxes, so let's tax the top five spices, and, and he lists them off as these five, uh, uh, peppercorn, nutmeg, saffron, and all the other rarer ones. That These are the big five of, it's not just, oh, it's spices, because they're valuable. We would see like a trade cartel for these things. And they explain, you know, this is a pre-modern world where spices are ridiculously expensive and something the elite use to show off their wealth. That A Dance with Dragons, Davos Chapter 1, 
Saffron was worth more than gold. He isn't exaggerating. Saffron was worth more than gold. Davos had only tasted it once before when King Robert had sent him half a fish with it to him at a Feast of Dragonstone. The spices in this world are as valuable as oil to us. The, this is Like, the Dutch East India Company became a colonial empire based on the spice industry. This is what fueled a lot of our real world's major wars and colonial efforts. Now, Take a step back, and I want you to talk about this in the comments. What does this tell us, not just about this specific question, but everything? The overall attitude they have towards the source material is what won me over most of all. Not just the specific answer, but the way they framed it is, the books did X, we just build on that and expand on it to say Y. Every new story element they told me, they then backed up with book citations. They felt the need to back it up with book citations. Earnestly worried about the story making sense. And frankly, a lot of this may have come directly from Martin. I said in the other videos, again, the broadest strokes of, well, this is what the three main factions are like, and why would they be located in South Oreos? I, something on that broad of a level may come from Martin himself. So, walking me through it, it, just this made sense from the books. First two points. We already, and they framed it as, we already knew the Valyrians had colonies in Sothorios. The world book said that. That was the phrase they used. We didn't make that up. The world book said that. And it was surprising when we opened the world book. They never said that before. Well, actually, the Valyrians had colonies there. And just, really? Okay. So, that's not their invention. Valyrians had colonies in Sothorios, and two... The merchant circle to the Jade Sea and back is the wealthiest of all, with silk and exotic spices from Yi the, the books have said this. Now, I knew a lot of this off the top of my head, because I know the books well, so we were just rattling it off, synergy there in, in our discussion. But if you're not familiar with all this, and you haven't read the books or anything, uh, I'm going to show you a lot of maps now to demonstrate it. Here's map of the world. you got Westeros in the west, Yi in the east there, Valyria in the middle. Simplified map, zooming in, there's Free Cities, Slaver's Bay, Sothorios. And even closer now, you've got Valyria, Giscar, Sothorios. We already knew that back around 5,000 years ago, when Valyria was first expanding, they first discovered dragons. They spread throughout their peninsula, but eventually ran into the old Giscari Empire, who were the big imperial superpower of Essos up until that point, sort of like Egypt. And they fought over various lands, they fought a lot of battles over the Isle of Cedars between them, but we never really had that much information on the Giscari. They don't have an explicit chapter in the World Book, it's just mentioned how the Valyrians defeated them. The World Book just briefly mentions this, but it's intriguing that, well, the Giscari Empire actually colonized the northern coasts of Sothorios and even built cities there, the chief of which was Zamatar. It started out as a Giscari colony. And eventually Valyria fought a series of five great wars with the Giscari, which it turns out were intercontinental, that they spread to Sothorios. It's said that during the Third War, the Valyrians conquered the Basilisk Isles, which are this island chain off the main coast. And then sometime later... During the Fourth War, the Fourth Giscari War, they outright conquered Zamatar and other colony cities in northern Sothorios. Just as part of their war with the Giscari, it hadn't occurred to them to expand to Sothorios, but they took it because Giscari had it. And then in the Fifth and Final War, they advanced to Old Geese itself, burned it to the ground, and sowed the earth with salt. So by the end of the Giscari Wars, they had conquered and inherited these originally Giscari colonies along the northern coast. So this is the full map of the lands of the Valyrian Freehold, including Sothorios and Dragonstone to the west there, as best we can discern it. So screenshot this if you need to. This is what I'm using as the Freehold lands map. So we already knew that the World Book told us that the Valyrians had colonies in Sothorios that were originally Giscari ones they conquered. And we also know that the wealthiest trade routes in the world are the ones going to Yi for their exotic silks and spices. 
Now, third point. The shipping lanes to the Jade Sea run clockwise due to winds and currents. It, they said that in World Book. And also, most merchant ships avoid the open ocean but hug the coasts. It says, like, the Summer Islanders are the only people that are brave enough, they have ships good enough to go over open ocean, that on the whole, most merchant traffic hugs the coasts and tries to go clockwise when they're in the Jade Sea. So here's the lands of the Jade Sea. You got Karth on the upper left there, that we know that. The east of them is Yiti and the Isle of Leng. Leng is sort of like Japan, but anyway, you see that Great Marak Island is the biggest island in the world, and it nearly blocks transit into the Jade Sea, except for these straits at the northern and southern ends. Karth dominates the northern one, the Jade Gate, so they have this big fleet and they stop any ships that try to get through and exact heavy trade tolls on them. That's why Karth is so wealthy from shipping tolls. So, I, I drew this in here, that the shipping routes do the currents and winds, that a ship would go clockwise past Karth on the northern end of Great Merak, go to Yeeti, then circle around all the other lands and come around going back west along the southern end of Great Merak. Simplified map here. You go east to Yiti, past Karth, and then you come back from Yiti around, they're called the Cinnamon Straits, at the southern end of Great Merak. Then where do you go? How do you get back west? Just looking at a map. Well, post-Doom, because Sothorios is uninhabited now, well, not uh, by any great civilizations anymore. It was all destroyed in the doom. It seems that people hug the coast of the western side of Great Merak and then slowly make their way against the current back to Slaver's Bay. That's why there's there cities on the western end of Great Merak. But when the Valyrians were around and the seas were safer, how would you get from the Cinnamon Straits at the southern end of Great Merak to Valyria? Well, you'd just hug the coast of Sothorios and keep heading west, because the currents are now, on the southern end, they're going clockwise, and you go around and you get back to Valyria. And again, most merchant ships aren't sturdy enough to just sail straight across open ocean. They have to hug coasts. You see the orange line I drew in here. They can't sail normally across the summer sea. So it's either you go north up Great Merak and go back against the current, or wouldn't the easiest way to be go with the current back to Valyria? So, and this is a comparison I made, Zamatar is essentially the southern equivalent of Karth. That just as Karth dominates the shipping lanes going to Yiti, which have to go north because they run clockwise, Zamatar dominates the trade routes as they come back west on the southern side. That just Well, it's wealthy for the same reason Karth is wealthy. And what does this tell us about their approach to it? That they actually bother to think out the reasons for things. You're not just, hey, how can dragons possibly fly from Dragonstone to the Wall? And just everyone working on it has been just dismissive of this basic question. of The directors and everyone just mocking us. How dare you judge us? Or... How can a character in The Long Night, which is basically Bronze Age Britain, be called a socialite in the character description you gave, that they're not a courtly society? How dare you judge us? No, they gave reasons that I fully understood and agreed with. They didn't just want it to make sense to themselves, or because it's cool, but specifically written in terms of explaining it in a way that fans of the books would be satisfied with, with citations. They kept backing up everything they were telling with citations from the series Bible is framed that way. They actually care if book fans think the show makes sense. They want to win them back. As I said in the overview, that this then gets into questions of diversity, immigration, and cultural identity. That, as the original leak said, this story centers on the decline and fall of Valyria, a colonial empire which ruled half of the known world at its height. It reveals the social, economic, and political crises which tore apart the empire from within. A major focus of this prequel is on diversity 
as it deals with issues of immigration, naturalization, and cultural identity, all within a multi-ethnic democratic state. The central conflict that kicks off the series is, what does it mean to be Valyrian, and who gets to share in that power and prestige? And again, the original leak point out the capital of Sothorios is this major port city like Constantinople with a multiracial society. Well, due to being a major sea lane hub, this isn't like the Erie in the Vale, where it's up in the mountains, isolated. They are a bustling port city with a major ethnic melting pot that people come there from all across the Valyrian freehold from the free cities to Slaver's Bay. And on top of that, because they're dominating the shipping lanes, they even have people from the Summer Isles in the west and Yeeti in the east. This was confirmed to me, I'm not speculating it, they said there's a sizable number of characters in it who are from the Summer Isles and from Yeeti. Now, the Freeholders, as a faction have very diverse origins. There's not just one origin for each of them. Some of them are local elites they absorbed in conquests, but kept free. Like if you're conquering the Gauls in France, you leave some of the local elites as, you know, low-level town governor or something. Others are descendants of peoples they enslaved a long time ago, whose personal ancestors then earned their freedom centuries ago. Like Mir. Mir could have been conquered at the, uh, the Roinar around there, were conquered 600 years ago, but over time won their freedom and thought of themselves more as Mirish. A few are even. So, a mixture of local peoples that were either kept free to rule or earned their freedom hundreds of years ago are descended from conquered peoples. A few of them are even ex slaves or freedmen in their lifetime. And a couple descend from the poorest working-class Valyrians back when Valyria had a working class, like Pentos. That might be an exception, but a few of them are like that. A few of them started out as cults that voluntarily removed themselves to live at the fringes of the freehold, away from the control of others. I think of them as like the Amish or the Quakers that we're removing ourselves from the other society we see as decadent. This isn't their description. The World Book explains this as this is how Kohor, Norvos, and Lorath started out. They started out as colonies founded by religious dissidents. Uh, Norvos has its bearded priests, Kohor, its, its, uh, its black goat, that they wanted to live apart from what they saw as the decadence of, of the capital. So some of them went out for that reason. Other ones are conquered peoples like Mir or Pentos. But another group and they highlighted this to me, are immigrants and their descendants. Merchants from Yeeti and the Summer Isles who followed trade routes to seek their fortune. Now when I say immigrants, I mean immigrants, like, oh, oh there's immigrants in this, in this world? Well, yeah, like, how would you describe Tobo Mott? The Kohor master blacksmith who moved to King's Landing and took on Gendry as his apprentice. He is an immigrant in King's Landing, and there are people like that in Xamitar who are from the Summer Isles, or from Yeti. Or Chitaya and her daughter Alayaya uh, are both immigrants from the Summer Isles who moved to King's Landing. There's people like Chitaya in Xamitar. And in in the books, Chitaya owns the high-end expensive brothel catering to the upper nobility, which Robert frequented, and where Ned found Robert's bastard baby daughter. And to stress this, when I say immigrants, I mean skilled immigrants. It's not, they took our jobs! For unskilled labor, Valeria had slaves. Yet free workers could never hope for their cheap labor to compete with that. So there aren't, like, waves of immigrants from the Summer Isles looking for manual labor jobs in Valyria. It's not low-level people. I'm talking Tobo Mott types or Chataya, who's who's a wealthy brothel owner. There's a great demand for merchants and bankers, is how they explained it. And this makes sense, that it's a niche the Dragon Lords weren't filling, that the Dragon Lords were these old-minded, old aristocracy of wealth is generated by land, that they weren't really interested in commerce. So 
over time, merchants from Yeti and the Summer Isles just gradually drifted there on, you know, making your shipping run. You go, wait, maybe I should just stay and run my shipping company from here instead of in the Summer Isles. So there was a great influx of skilled, when I say skilled labor, mostly merchants. It was this niche they weren't filling. There was a great demand for merchants to help build the freehold. They were very beneficial, that you need banking and commerce to grow. So it attracted many foreigners. It was, I mean, on a scale of centuries, there was a great influx of other peoples. So there's people in this show that aren't from within the borders of the Valyrian freehold. So, and this was stressed to me, the freeholders as a faction can come from all over the Valyrian freehold and indeed the rest of the world. But their new faction in the civil wars has its leaders gather to meet in Zamatar. Their representatives come there. And Zamatar has a sizable number of immigrants from Yeti and the Summer Isles, just moving along the shipping lanes. And here's a map where you can see if the Summer Isles want to go east to the Jade Sea and Yeti, well, there's Zamatar right there. And as I already said, coming back from Yeti, you go to Zamatar. So this made sense of why would they, they be this international hub like that? Well, yeah, they're ideally located to be that. I did region-by-region region overviews for all the other places, so now let me do one for the Summer Isles, even though they're not part of the Freehold, because they feature prominently in this. Characters from there, at least. That Here's a map that the three main ones are Wallano, Amburu, and Jala, and a couple of smaller ones, like... Most of their ships are built in the shipyards of Kaj Island, but Wallano's the most populous one. And they're located straight south from the Narrow Sea, but west of mainland Sothorios. And here's artwork of, of them from the world of Ice and Fire, that there are these great thriving civilizations there with um, multiple large full-scale cities. Uh, the biggest one is Tall Trees Town. There's a couple of other ones. Summer Islanders are a great race of sailors and explorers, with a huge and powerful merchant marine, the, the famed trading fleets of the Summer Islanders, and their ships are some of the most far-traveled in the entire world. Uh, one ship, the Cinnamon Wind, during A Song of Ice and Fire in the novels, travels from Carth to Bravos to Old Town. This one ship and one crew. And you go, oh, where are all the black people in this? There aren't any. They come to you. They're these prolific mariners. They're in every major port city, and they travel around a lot. It's not like wildlings who just stay up on a mountain or something. That when Samuel Tarley needs to go to Old Town, he takes a ship from the Wall to Bravos, books passage on the Cinnamon Wind, and he's with Maester Amon, who's dying, and... They go, oh, Maester Amon sent you, and you're looking for the, the dragon prophecy. We met Daenerys Targaryen when we were in Karth. We saw her dragons with our own eyes. And it's a great way to link the story together. Summer Islanders are African black, and loosely, they're sort of like fantasy Africa. I mean, like the advanced version, like, it's their version of Wakanda, basically, I keep saying, that with bits of the Caribbean due to their geography as an archipelago, that these thriving Africa-inspired city-states, unlike the wild and largely unexplored Sothorios, that type of, you know, it's fantasy Africa in the sense of, you know, like, jungle stuff. This is like Timbuktu and other Africa-inspired fantasy where it's civilizations. Apart from being uh, sailors, they're also famed as the best archers in the entire world. Officially, they're famous for being wonderful archers. And the Summer Isles are rich in natural resources, the ones people in this world really care about, which it isn't oil or uranium. For a medieval world, they are rich in spices. You know, like pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg. But but not ultra-expensive saffron. Saffron only comes from Yeti. So when you're looking at them economically, what makes the Summer Islands important? Uh, they're rich in spices. I asked Elio, and he said they're probably where most of the sugar comes from in their world. When you see that Sansa is eating a sugared lemon cake. Well, where did that sugar come from? He said, well, probably the Summer Isles due to their climate. And just First you get the sugar, then you get the money, then you get the power. So they get big sugar barons of the Summer Isles. Uh, they're also rich in hardwoods because they're, they're forested islands, and they're a great center of shipbuilding. 
these, they said Kaj just has some of the biggest uh, shipyards in the world. Uh, they're also rich in gemstones and exotic animals like parrots and tiger cubs and things. And again, if you haven't read The World of Ice and Fire, there's a whole chapter on the Summer Isles, and they're one of the best chapters in the book. It's just a lot of detail about them and their history and what they're like that we didn't have before, because they're just mentioned in passing. It explains they're rich in things that grow, like spices and timber and sugar, animals and, and some gemstones, but they're poor in metals, all metals, from gold to even iron and tin. So they don't have a lot of iron, so they can't make a lot of steel plate, and they don't have a lot of gold either. But they have things that are really expensive, like cinnamon. So that's why they became this great trading culture, that they, they have these merchant marines selling pepper, cinnamon, and hardwood in Westeros and the Free Cities, and coming back with iron and gold that they need. So that they're dependent, they have an un this unequal amount of resources. That we have a lot of spices, but not enough iron. And it says in their world book chapter that a thriving trade grew up between the Summer Isles and the freehold of Valyria. A fashion developed amongst the dragon lords for monkeys, apes, panther cubs, and parrots from the isles. They, this gives us a window into what we might see of Valyrian culture amongst the dragon lord factions in Valyria in this prequel show. They said there was kind of a fad for rich people to buy parrots from the Summer Isles. The dragon lords liked having menageries of exotic animals from there. So it's just one of the little details you might have something to go on there, but I don't know. But it'd be fun if we have like an episode where you see someone just going, oh, I'm getting it. Father, I'm buying another parrot f from the Summer Isles. Well, you're just doing that to display our wealth. Well, we are dragon lords. Just, or, you know, a rich person needs to own a tiger because, well, it's a panther. I need it. The hypothetical example, they didn't tell me this, but they said there are Summer Islander characters in Zamatar for what we're dealing with, is someone saying, she'll be like, my great-grandfather came to Zamatar with one ship to trade cinnamon. My grandmother had ten ships. My father built that into the Cinnamon Cartel with a fleet of a hundred ships. You know, like the Trade Federation. Well, we're the Cinnamon Cartel. Fleet of a hundred ships, and now I'm third generation born in the Freehold. But my vote doesn't count because the Dragon Lords say I'm still not a Valyrian. Why do I keep paying them taxes? It reminds me, you know, the whole immigrant, when they say we're talking about immigration, the whole immigrant thing, you know, from Godfather Part Two, you know, the, the scene with Michael and the racist senator, where this racist senator is yelling at him for being Italian that, I don't like your kind of people, I don't like to see you come out to this clean country with your oily hair, or dressed up in those silk suits, trying to pass yourselves off as decent Americans, I'll do business with you, but the fact is that I despise your masquerade, the dishonest way you pose yourself. When he's talking to that racist senator, just, look. They're both part of the same hypocrisy, but... So is that, that whole immigrant thing, if you're not real Americans, you're Italians, well, you're not real Valyrians, you're immigrants from the Summer Isles. And it's an issue they're going to deal with. Now, this is the third point I wanted to get to in this video, and this is very important, and it is leak information that I was discussing. It, it says this in the series Bible, there's all these essays explaining how they're going to approach it, that they showed me and read them off. Physical sets and locations. What are we actually going to see on screen? Not as an abstraction, but okay, this has to exist as a TV show. 